Preface The feeling of having no power over people and events is generally unbearable to us. When we feel helpless, we feel miserable. No one wants less power. Everyone wants more. In the world today, however, it is dangerous to seem too power-hungry, to be overt with your power moves. We have to seem fair and decent. So, we need to be subtle, congenial, yet cunning, democratic, yet devious. Law 47 Do not go past the mark you aimed for. In victory, learn when to stop. Judgment The moment of victory is often the moment of greatest peril. In the heat of victory, arrogance and overconfidence can push you past the goal you had aimed for, and by going too far, you make more enemies than you defeat. Do not allow success to go to your head. There is no substitute for strategy and careful planning. Set a goal, and when you reach it, stop. Transgression of the Law in 559 BC, a young man named Cyrus gathered an immense army from the scattered tribes of Persia and marched against his grandfather, Astyages, king of the Medes. He defeated Astyages with ease, had himself crowned king of Medea and Persia, and began to forge the Persian Empire. Victory followed victory in quick succession. Cyrus defeated Croesus, ruler of Lydia, then conquered the Ionian islands and other smaller kingdoms. He marched on Babylon and crushed it. Now he was known as Cyrus the Great, King of the World. After capturing the riches of Babylon, Cyrus set his sights on the east, on the half-barbaric tribes of the Massagetae, a vast realm on the Caspian Sea. A fierce warrior race led by Queen Tomiris, the Massagetae lacked the riches of Babylon, but Cyrus attacked them anyway believing himself superhuman and incapable of defeat. The Massagetae would fall easily to his vast armies, making his empire immense. In 529 BC, then, Cyrus marched to the wide river Araxes, gateway to the kingdom of the Massagetae. As he set up camp on the western bank, he received a message from Queen Tamiris, king of the Medes, she told him, I advise you to abandon this enterprise, for you cannot know if in the end it will do you any good. Rule your own people and try to bear the sight of me ruling mine. But of course you will refuse my advice, as the last thing you wish for is to live in peace. Tamiris, confident of her army's strength and not wishing to delay the inevitable battle, offered to withdraw the troops on her side of the river allowing Cyrus to cross its waters safely and fight her army on the eastern side, if that was his desire. Cyrus agreed, but instead of engaging the enemy directly, he decided to play a trick. The Massagetae knew few luxuries. Once Cyrus had crossed the river and made his camp on the eastern side, he set the table for an elaborate banquet full of meat, delicacies, and strong wine. Then he left his weakest troops in the camp and withdrew the rest of the army to the river. A large Massagetai detachment soon attacked the camp and killed all of the Persian soldiers in a fierce battle. Then, overwhelmed by the fabulous feast that had been left behind, they ate and drank to their heart's content. Later, inevitably, they fell asleep. The Persian army returned to the camp that night killing many of the sleeping soldiers and capturing the rest. Among the prisoners was their general, a youth named Spargapisces, son of Queen Tomiris. When the queen learned what had happened, she sent a message to Cyrus, chiding him for using tricks to defeat her army. Now listen to me, she wrote, and I will advise you for your own good. Give me back my son and leave my country with your forces intact and be content with your triumph over a third part of the Massagetai. If you refuse, I swear by the son, our master, to give you more blood than you can drink for all your gluttony. Cyrus scoffed at her. He would not release her son. He would crush these barbarians. The queen's son, seeing he would not be released, could not stand the humiliation, and so he killed himself. The news of her son's death overwhelmed Tamiris. 
She gathered all the forces that she could muster in her kingdom, and whipping them into a vengeful frenzy, engaged Cyrus's troops in a violent and bloody battle. Finally, the Massagetai prevailed. In their anger, they decimated the Persian army, killing Cyrus himself. After the battle, Tamiris and her soldiers searched the battlefield for Cyrus's corpse. When she found it, she cut off his head and shoved it into a wineskin full of human blood, crying out, Though I have conquered you and live, yet you have ruined me by treacherously taking my son. See now, I fulfill my threat. You have your fill of blood. After Cyrus's death, the Persian Empire quickly unraveled. One act of arrogance undid all of Cyrus's good work. Interpretation there is nothing more intoxicating than victory, and nothing more dangerous. Cyrus had built his great empire on the ruins of a previous one. A hundred years earlier, the powerful Assyrian Empire had been totally destroyed, its once splendid capital of Nineveh but ruins in the sand. The Assyrians had suffered this fate because they had pushed too far, destroying one city-state after another until they lost sight of the purposes of their victories and also of the costs. They overextended themselves and made many enemies who were finally able to band together and destroy them. Cyrus ignored the lesson of Assyria. He paid no heed to the warnings of oracles and advisors. He did not worry about offending a queen. His many victories had gone to his head clouding his reason. Instead of consolidating his already vast empire, he pushed forward. Instead of recognizing each situation as different, he thought each new war would bring the same result as the one before, as long as he used the methods he knew, ruthless force and cunning. Understand, in the realm of power, you must be guided by reason. To let a momentary thrill or an emotional victory influence or guide your moves will prove fatal. When you attain success, step back. Be cautious. When you gain victory, understand the part played by the particular circumstances of a situation, and never simply repeat the same actions again and again. History is littered with the ruins of victorious empires and the corpses of leaders who could not learn to stop and consolidate their gains. Keys to Power Power has its own rhythms and patterns. Those who succeed at the game are the ones who control the patterns and vary them at will, keeping people off balance while they set the tempo. The essence of strategy is controlling what comes next, and the elation of victory can upset your ability to control what comes next in two ways. First, you owe your success to a pattern that you are apt to try to repeat. You will try to keep moving in the same direction without stopping to see whether this is still the direction that is best for you. Second, success tends to go to your head and make you emotional. Feeling invulnerable, you make aggressive moves that ultimately undo the victory you have gained. The lesson is simple. The powerful vary their rhythms and patterns, change course, adapt to circumstance, and learn to improvise. Rather than letting their dancing feet impel them forward, they step back and look where they are going. It is as if their bloodstream bore a kind of antidote to the intoxication of victory, letting them control their emotions and come to a kind of mental halt when they have attained success. They steady themselves, give themselves the space to reflect on what has happened, examine the role of circumstance and luck in their success. As they say in riding school, you have to be able to control yourself before you can control the horse.